Hello and welcome to the exchange and transport of gases part 2. I hope you have already gone through the part 1 of this as we are going to take some reference from the previous lesson. Uh, let's start with hemoglobin versus myoglobin. At 95 mmHg, this is the partial pressure of oxygen, hemoglobin is 97% saturated. So, if you remember, I have shown in this uh, diagram that PO2 at this level is 95 mmHg. So, when the partial pressure of oxygen was 95 mmHg, the percent saturation of hemoglobin was 97%. When the percent saturation went down to 40 mmHg, at this point, at the region of systemic vein and the right chamber of heart in the pulmonary artery, then the percent saturation of hemoglobin is 75%. That means under normal conditions only 22% unloading takes place. And this is quite consistent with this what we have seen in the last lesson that uh, amount of oxygen present in 100 ml of blood is 20 ml. So if 100 ml of blood crosses from this uh, a tissue then nearly 5 ml is transported to the tissues. So it is consistent with this 22%. Uh, During exercise PO2 in the vein becomes 20 mmHg during which percent saturation of hemoglobin is 35%. That means during exercise conditions 62% unloading takes place. Hemoglobin shows cooperativity means hemoglobin has got four subunits. So when an oxygen molecule binds with the one subunit, it increases the affinity of the neighboring hemes means neighboring subunits to bind with the oxygen. That's why there must be sufficient oxygen so that every subunit can bind with it. And that's why hemoglobin does not take oxygen at low partial pressure. Unlike hemoglobin, myoglobin is a single subunit heme protein and it shows non-cooperative binding and it takes oxygen at a relatively low partial pressure of oxygen. It also exists in deoxymyoglobin and oxymyoglobin form. So as you can see the structure of myoglobin here, it has got a single subunit and with heme in the center. When the partial pressure of oxygen is 14 mmHg, here we are trying to compare myoglobin and hemoglobin. So if you remember uh, hemoglobin was having a percent saturation of 75% at 40 mmHg while myoglobin is having a percent saturation of 95% at 40 mmHg. Even if the PO2 falls below 5 mmHg the saturation is hardly less than 60% in case of myoglobin. So as you can see myoglobin can't donate oxygen to a greater extent as compared to the hemoglobin. So that is why myoglobin is not an ideal carrier of the oxygen. So after this brief comparison of hemoglobin and myoglobin, let's move to the transport of carbon dioxide. First, as dissolved in plasma, 7% of the carbon dioxide transports in this way. So it is clear from here that carbon dioxide is more soluble in plasma than the oxygen. Second, as carb amino hemoglobin HbCO2, 23% of carbon dioxide uh, is carried in the blood by this uh, way uh, as carb amino hemoglobin. What happens? Carbon dioxide, it combines with the amine group of the alpha and beta chains present in the hemoglobin forming carb amino compound in a reversible reaction. Most of the transport of carbon dioxide takes place in the form of bicarbonate ions. So how bicarbonate ions are formed? Some of the dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with water forming carbonic acid H2CO3 which immediately dissociates into bicarbonate HCO3- and hydrogen ions H+. This reaction is slow in plasma but fast in the RBC due to the abundance of enzyme carbonic anhydrase in the RBC. So as you can see this reaction carbon dioxide when combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase it forms carbonic acid and again under the catalysis of carbonic anhydrase 
H2CO3 is dissociated into H plus and HCO3 minus. And most of the carbon dioxide, nearly 70% of the carbon dioxide is transported in the form of bicarbonate ions. So what is happening here? Let's see this bicarbonate comes out in the plasma. So in the last line, as we have said that uh, this reaction is slow in the plasma, but fast in the RBC due to the presence of carbonic anhydrase. So the SCO3 formed in the RBC, it comes to the plasma down the concentration gradient since the, there is less HCO3 minus in the plasma so HCO3 minus diffuses from the RBC into the plasma so in exchange chloride ions move from plasma into the RBC maintaining the electrical balance between the blood plasma and the RBC cytosol and this phenomenon is called as chloride shift or hamburgers phenomena this occurs at the level of tissues, means at the level of internal respiration. So we have seen here that in order to compensate the negative ions coming in the plasma, plasma sends negative ions to the RBC. So this is chloride shift. And how can you remember this? Uh, you can remember it as Kal hum burger khane andar gai. Kal stands for CL, burger khane andar gai, and that's how um, you can remember it. Let's go to the next slide at the level of lungs this reaction gets reversed because as we know that SCO3 can't be exhaled from the lungs so at some point of time it's, it must be converted into CO2 so how does this conversion takes place uh, so SCO3 minus enters into the RBC again means at this point it came into plasma and at the level of lungs it enters RUC again and it is converted into H2CO3. SCO3 at the level of lungs comes in the RBC. SCO3 minus plus H plus under the effect of carbonic anhydrase it is converted to H2CO3 and again carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the breakdown of H2CO3 into H2O and CO2 and this CO2 is exhaled via the lungs and this is the reverse chloride shift. And this is necessary for the removal of carbon dioxide. Now we will talk about Halden effect. Halden effect, it is based on the fact that binding of oxygen to hemoglobin leads to the formation of oxyhemoglobin, greatly influence the amount of carbon dioxide that can be transported in the blood. Means the formation of hemoglobin greatly influence that, uh, that what amount of carbon dioxide will be transported in the blood. So let's see uh, at the level of lungs the uptake of oxygen means as you know if somebody is in inhaling the air so at that time oxygen is coming and that oxygen is combining with the hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. And as more and more oxyhemoglobin is being formed, so that will replace the hemoglobin bound carbon dioxide as more oxygen will, uh, would require the hemoglobin to bind with it. So carbon dioxide will gradually get replaced from the hemoglobin, facilitating its elimination through the exhalation. So this is one way of the removal of carbon dioxide. And the second way is formation of oxyhemoglobin uh, and we know that oxyhemoglobin is a strong acid so it releases H plus ions into the blood and these H plus ion combines with HCO3 minus to forms H2CO3 which is again dissociated in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to release CO2 plus water and this CO2 is finally exhaled. So this is Halden effect means it is telling you about the increased removal of carbon dioxide. It is just a mirror image of Bohr's effect where both in where in both the cases oxygen and carbon dioxide competes for the hemoglobin occupancy or for occupying the hemoglobin. So here you have seen that how carbon dioxide is being removed by two different ways. And if you can't remember these things in the Halden effect, simply remember loading of oxygen into the blood means as oxygen is coming into the blood, as it is combining with the hemoglobin to form the oxyhemoglobin causes unloading of CO2 at the lungs. 
so co2 is getting unloaded at the lungs because hemoglobin is no longer available for the co2 so it is getting dissociated from the hemoglobin and it is getting exhaled out so this is all in the exchange and transport of gases see you in the next lesson thank you